This is a complex conversation. And I've been trying for the past maybe 90 minutes in preparing this presentation, thinking carefully about what I want to put across. Now, you may notice that I do ask a lot of questions with regards to the COVID pandemic and around what happened in the pandemic, especially with the broad use of COVID vaccines. But it's not because I have any personal issue with pharma. They are a critical part of health delivery. But I think it's important when there are issues to try and call them out. And this is actually in protection of pharma if they're listening, because they really don't like some of these conversations. To put it into context, after raising awareness on what I'm going to be talking about with abduction, within an hour of doing a post, I was targeted with other posts, they you know, taking them down. You know, I'm used to this by now. The point being is that I know that this is a very relevant conversation. Now, I'm trying to break it down as simply as I can. But the first thing you have to know is that you will have to take a look at this interview that was done, depending on when you watched this, yesterday. And this is about testing the hidden gaps in mRNA safety. And it was with uh, Christy Grace. And uh, this is the link in the description. You must sit through or at least read the article to hear what the issues that were raised were and then reflect on why I'm making this current historical link. So let's start at where this really took off. And for those who are old enough to have heard about Zantac, Zantac is a drug that um, we use. Uh, it's, it's, it's protecting the stomach against acid, and we have used it for probably 40 years. And Zantac was recalled in 2019 because of an association with carcinogenic properties, okay? And in order to understand what we're talking about here, you have to understand why this is historically relevant. So part of what I was doing was going through all the history to try and see if I could make it make sense. So I got uh, this paper here from India, the ranitidine controversy from blockbuster to ban. And this was just looking at the history as to what happened. It became the global health debate in 2019. It was sold under the name Zantac. And it was found to generate this product, NDMA, which is nitrosodimethylamine. Just remember NDMA. And this is probably a human carcinogen. And so because of this, work, they then pulled Zantac from the market in 2019. Now, this is serious cost, so that you understand this is not just about removing a drug from the market, because removing it from the market, for one, hit pharma quite hard, almost a billion in terms of what they were doing, promotion, producing drug, and so on. Even though it was off patent, many companies were still producing it. And as well, it came with legal ramifications. And the legal ramifications, this here is from GSK, issued in October of 2024, about a year ago. So they have about 80,000 cases in the USA for product liability, up to 2.2 billion, okay? So this is serious money here. Similarly, Pfizer um, was involved because they also were using the drug Zantac, and their payout is set to be about between 200 to 250 million in settlements. So this caused quite a impact on industry, and I can understand that they're sensitive about this topic, but it doesn't mean that we don't address it and we don't look at it carefully. So. Essentially, what happened was that in about 2018, uh, I think it was a Chinese company, was doing some routine work with one of their drugs, Valsartan, 
and they found that because of their process, they were creating NDMA, the same potential carcinogen. So they flagged this and they, those particular batches were pulled. It doesn't mean you can't use Valsartan, Valsartan is okay. But those batches were pulled and then subsequently, then in 2019, an independent company then goes and thinks, well, if this could happen with Valsartan, we think that chemically the setup is the same with ranitidine, which is Zantac. So they then went independently looking for this connection and they found it in 2019 and they raised awareness of it. So uh, just to, to give context on uh, these things, so uh, th this company, uh, Valley Shore, produced a citizen's petition. Uh, they put it in front of the FDA and it led to an immediate market withdrawal of all ranitidine products. So it shows that citizens do have the impact to put things in place. It's important to get the balance on this because um, what I found is another interesting article um, here that was the challenge to it, the Zantac scare and junk science. And in this one here, they highlighted that um, a federal judge in December of 2022 dismissed the claims that it causes cancer. Um, now, uh, the only problem with this is that I'm sure that if pharma agreed with that, they wouldn't have done the payouts. But the main point they were saying is that the testing that Valishore did was at a different temperature to what you would get in the human body. But that's a whole different point, just to make sure that you get the balance in all of this. The main issue is that this product produces NDMA, and NDMA will then bind to specific proteins, especially DNA, if it can get into the nucleus. And through that process, it can then potentially lead to cancers. That's the essence of it. Why am I giving you all that background? Because the, the premise of why this occurs is a chemical reaction that we call adduction. And to give you an idea as to what I'm talking about, I had some images set up from before. So I'll, I'll take you through these, um, these images so that you can see what I'm talking about and how it's relevant in terms of mRNA, because this is the connection. And this is what Christy Grace was talking about. And as I said, if you want to see that interview, the link to her preprint paper, look in the description, click on the link. It's well worth listening to you. Complex science, but important for everyone to understand. So this is essentially what you have in a lipid nanoparticle, the basics of it. Um, you have inside it the strands of mRNA, and on the outside you have the lipids, and this is what allows it to get into the cell and trigger an immune response. Perfect. It, when you go a little bit closer in terms of the science, you realize it's a far more complex particle. And you have cholesterol, the ionizable lipids, the peg lipids on the outside. This prevents it from being destroyed by the immune system. And these ionizable lipids on the inside help to stabilize these mRNA strands and protect them. One of the problems is, or the questions is, when it has released the mRNA, what happens to these ionizable lipids? And this is the question that Christy Grace was making reference to. And this was the point of if you can have adduction with NDMA, so this is the product that can be produced with ranitidine and it binds to DNA and causes these risks, can you have a similar thing with the ionizable lipid nanoparticles? So it's it's let's look carefully. I'm not talking about the lipid nanoparticle. It's specifically with these ionizable lipids, which are different depending on which mRNA vaccine you're using. And so these ionizable lipids that then would get released, what Christy Grace has been pointing out is that if they can become positively charged, depending on the pH inside the cell or if they're in an endosome, they can then bind to proteins, RNA, 
or if it could get in the nucleus DNA. And once they bind, these structures become permanently altered because it's not a symbol, it's a covalent bond. And so it changes it. So I was looking at this in relation to um, embalmers clots and abnormal clotting, um, but that's a whole different story. I'm just using these images here so that you understand that principle that if you have these binding to proteins, if you can then have permanent changes to them, which can produce risk, okay? That's the essence as to where we are. Now, when we think about this in the context of the, um, the risks going forward, some people may say, well, there is no evidence that this is occurring. And what Christy was pointing out is that the research hasn't been done adequately. They have done some research, but based on her expertise with the platform in the past and her understanding, she's saying that actually the tests you're doing here are not actually adequate to exclude potential genotoxic risk. And the reason why she had said that was largely because this had been looked at somewhat in 2021 because they were noticing that they were losing mRNA activity in lipid nanoparticles. And critically, what they noticed is that there was evidence of adduction within that whole um, situation. And just so, let's just do a control F. Their investigation of mRNA adduction by aldehydes and so they were looking at all of these patterns here in relation to what happens. And they found that it did occur. And critically, depending on the temperature of, um, that they checked it at, this could occur at higher amounts, higher temperatures. And I'm just getting that image here for you so that you can see um, what it is that they, they were looking at. Um, uh, can't find it here. But the, the point is, is that they didn't know that this occurred. So it's not that it doesn't occur, it's whether or not it's relevant. So what Christie has been highlighting is that why do you leave that floating? Just do the tests. Because as she said, the tests are not difficult or expensive to do. You know, from her point of view, I mean, it's not her money. She wouldn't, she couldn't take her own money. But you're talking about even to just do simple testing is only 10,000 US. When you consider it in the context of billions that were earned, I think that this is a very, very reasonable request that this should be checked. So uh, one of the points that I think the most important point that I got when I listened to the interview, and if you've just joined, look in the description below, was this premise that I don't, how did I say this? The mRNA platform was initially developed primarily to be able to deliver certain proteins and, um, and, and, and specific uh, missing things from people who had genetic conditions, if they had cancer, specifically to help the body to cope in people who were already sick. Now, that use, I don't think, should change. They should continue to develop that. My question is whether or not the platform is the appropriate platform for broad vaccination use. So we have used it in the context of the COVID pandemic, emergency use situation, you needed something quickly, and they have proved that in an emergency, this can therefore be used. And even though there may be risks, based on the balance, they think that this could still work in an emergency. But the problem is, is that they are then moving forward with using it for RSV, for influenza, for all kinds of other things. And now this is a different context. This is no longer emergency use. You now definitely need to go back and do all the tests that you may have had to miss in the context of a pandemic. Just because you've used it doesn't mean that suddenly you can claim that everything is fine even though you haven't looked for it. That's the point that I'm making. 
And the warning I would give, as I said, I'm not the enemy here. I'm just the messenger. And the messenger is telling you that if you miss this, and it's turning up down the line, because now it's in public awareness, there is no way to avoid it, just do the tests. It's not complex. Identify if adduction is a problem. The issue, I think, is when I think about the, um, the paper that I just showed you, where in 2021, adduction does happen. What they can't necessarily say is whether or not it is clinically relevant. But it definitely occurs, and critically, it occurs at certain temperatures. The higher the temperature, the greater the risk that this will occur. And this is the point. So we know it happens, but we just don't know whether or not it's clinically or biologically significant. There is no excuse to not do these tests. And if I was talking to someone in pharma now, and I'd be talking to, say, the CEO of Moderna, who is basing this his whole system on mRNA, Did I just disappear? As I was saying, even if it costs you more to have to do some regulation, it would be far cheaper than having to pay out billions in the future. That's the point that I think is extremely important. I don't know, I understand the issue with regards to costs and uh, issues around regulation, but the point is, is that based on everything we've learned historically, safety should come first. And there is no excuse whether or not the regulators asked for these investigations is not an excuse in my view. If you know it can be done, if you know it should be done, please just get it done. And that's all that we have been asking to make sure that safety is the priority. Remember, if you're interested, Take a look at the interview. The link is in the description below. And critically, as we continue to raise awareness on Humming Heroes, remember that this book is probably one of the simplest and most effective strategies to protect yourself from all circulating viruses and bacteria. Have a good evening. A hero, an immune adventure. Humming Heroes, your lyrical guide to the body's defenders. Now on Amazon. Check the links below.